The, the Gospel of John is unique because John writes from a different perspective than the Synoptic Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has a grand passion by the Spirit of God to make known to the churches the fullness of who Jesus is, his deity, much more so than he is a great teacher, a great prophet, all of these things, not that the other Gospels say that, but that the, the, the churches were struggling in many ways with the fullness of identity and understanding that Jesus was the Son of God who takes away the the sins of the world. So all the way through this gospel of John, what we see is we see this emphasis by the Spirit of God for us to see this character of Jesus. Bless you. We, um, I'm just ADD enough, so try not to fall asleep. I'll wake you up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you, you, we get to see the character of God just verse by verse all the way through this gospel, which is beautiful. So this particular account of Christ with his disciples there by the well with this woman is one that ultimately probably takes four or five weeks to really unpack or look at uh, completely because there's so many nuances of the person of Christ. So the hope this morning is that what we'll see is we'll see he's a, he's a God that wants to lead us, uh, encounter us, direct us, be with us, uh, c cross every barrier, and be glorified in our lives. And so, as we begin to think about this, uh, you know, in order to follow someone, you have to know them. John understood that. He uh, understood the passion and the need for the body of Christ to be a people that would follow hard after Jesus. When my daughter was little, we were living up in Vail, Colorado at that time. We had started a church there and uh, being sent out from Santa Barbara. And uh, we raised our kids on the mountain. It was super fun. And she got to a place where she could kind of turn her skis pretty well. And, and we went up to the top. And we, we went down to a place called Jack Rabbit Alley. Jack Rabbit Alley was a, a, a little path that shot into the trees. And then it had these big turns that went through trees and around stuff and over dumps and all these things. And my daughter was frightened of it so much. She said, like, no, no, we can't. That's for the big skiers. That's for the good skiers. And I'm like, baby, you can do this. And I remember standing with her, looking at her tiny little face, going, no, honey, we got this. You got this. Follow me. You just do just what I'm doing. You follow me. We're going to have a blast. And so we started in. I remember I was going a big snowplow so she could kind of snowplow behind me as we dropped into the first spot. And I remember how it felt for her. She had such fear, but she was just looking at me. I'm going to follow dad. I'm going to follow dad. I'm going to follow dad. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow dad. And every turn we went, right, she just was on my tail. And every turn got a little bit better. And I looked back, and there she's just like, I'm doing it, you know, and that glow on her face and that delight in what she's doing, following me through something she didn't want to go into. It seemed harder than she could possibly imagine, and yet she was with one she trusts and knows and loves. Well, isn't life crazy? It, it isn't life full of these paths that go through just crazy trees and over bumps and all the stuff that happened? How important it is that we have our eyes on the one who leads us and directs us. So let's look right into John chapter 4. I'm going to read the, the account to you. You've got your Bibles. So you can get there with me. And, we'll, uh, and then we'll kind of uh, walk through it and look at this character of the one who leads us. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. When the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, oh, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. And we're only in the first part of this story. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna kind of look, look right into this. And I, I wanna start by considering what uh, we, ha we, we, we know from John the Baptist. In the previous chapter, John the Baptist is encountering the Pharisees and, and speaking of Jesus and allowing them to understand the fullness of who Christ is. If you recall, they're saying, well, Jesus 
is baptizing, we hear more than you are. And John would say, that's right. I've got to get out of the way. I must decrease, and he must increase. So, so if you look just a couple verses back in verse 35, just a snippet of what John the Baptist would say about who Jesus is, and you see him as the king. He said, the Father loves the Son. That's Jesus. And has given all things, all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's an intense challenge that he gives back to those Pharisees saying, look, you've got to know who he is. Of course he has to increase and we have to decrease. He's the son of God. You've got to know him because in him is life everlasting. And without him, oh, that wrath of sin will be upon you. You have to pay for it yourself. Christ is the one going to the cross. You see this, this great uh, weight of witness that's already happening. One of the dynamics that he says in this statement or as we start chapter four is he says, the, the, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was baptizing more. And it, it, it's beautiful because verse by verse, we begin to see John's heart as he's revealing the fullness of who God is. Who is, who is God? Well, he's Lord, he's over all. And he's Jesus, the Messiah, the one who saves. He's Savior of all. He is the fullness of God, and he is the Savior of the world. And even just in that verse, right off the bat, he's going, in light of what you know, <laughs> the Lord, he knew all this of what they were thinking about the Messiah, Jesus, and, he, and what he brings to the world. He is Lord and Savior. The moment that you and I know God as Lord in charge over all, as Savior, the one who's redeemed us, well, then it makes all the sense in the world to follow him. Because he's, he's the one that provides. He, he will take you through everything that's needed. He's the God who leads. Proverbs 23, and you know this so well, right? The Lord is my shepherd, David would say. And there was a boldness of confidence in God's provision as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In light of that knowledge that he is the shepherd, he is the Lord, if he is a shepherd, I have no need at all. I, I, I shall not want. He's the one who makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God's working out the path, the journey, for his purposes, so he's worthy of being followed. He, he leads me in that. He's a, he's a king that will lead. In, in Matthew's gospel, in verse 19, you see this calling of the disciples. And it sounds like you might have been just, just been there recently in, in Mark. And uh, it says that as soon as he said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, the scriptures tell us that immediately they left their nets and they followed him. We're going to follow you, Rabbi. There was power, authority. There, there was something unique about Jesus. And so therefore, there was an instant sense of like, we're in. When you know an encounter, and you imagine the disciples, as they looked upon Jesus, they saw uh, someone so different than the world. He was 100% flesh and man before them, and yet contained within every look in his eyes was no guile, no envy, no lust, none of the things that will tear down or, or, or tear apart. On his voice was no sense of sarcasm or bitterness. Everything that Jesus said, the fullness of God and the fullness of man, was so different. And so like, oh, we want to follow. We want to follow this one, and there's a stoke behind it. Guys, imagine what happens as a church when we are so confident who he is as Lord, as Savior. We're so confident that the path he has on, he will lead us, that we can follow him with just great stoke, with just great joy. Okay, all right, church has been flooded. Let's go for it. Let's, let's clean this place up. Let's do the next thing. Let's reach our neighbors. Let's reach our community here in Florida just with the a, with a, with a joy of it. I, I saw this, I had this moment uh, about three weeks ago driving in Santa Barbara and I was coming down this back alley. And I don't know if you have this, well, I've, I've actually seen it here in Florida already, is for some reason there seems to be just a million 12 and 13 year olds on e-bikes. Is that, is that true here as well? I haven't seen as many that age, but in, in, in California, it seems like anyone who's 11, 12, or 13 has an e-bike, and they're flying everywhere. There's someone on the back and someone on the front, and they're just cruising everywhere. And I was coming out of this alley behind some businesses, and ahead of me come four e-bikes packed with these, you know, these junior hires, two, two, two to a bike. And they felt in their heart 
like they were truly rolling. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they just had this vibe like, bum, bum, psh, bum, 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 you know, like they were just on Harleys or something coming. And they flew around, boom, boom, the second one. And the third one in, the kid that was on the back, all of a sudden with just a sense of joy in his heart goes, woohoo! <laughs> And it was so not manly. And it was, <laughs> it was so little kid, though their vibe was like, we got the world, you know? Woohoo! I thought, Lord, you know what? May we not have our act together, and may we be just, woohoo! I want to serve you. I want to follow you. You lead me, Lord. I will follow. Now, here's what's so beautiful is in this leading, that where the place is Jesus leads us, he wants us to take part in it. So it tells us that, John tells us that, listen, Jesus was baptizing more. It wasn't Jesus who was baptizing. It was the disciples baptizing. This is a really powerful statement. Christ, right off the bat, said, hey, I want you and your hands to be on the work of the kingdom with his disciples. They were there before the Messiah even had gone to the cross yet, and yet they got to be part of this ceremonial, beautiful process of seeing people cleansing their hearts, ready for the kingdom that was ahead. And they were part of it. And God wants you and I to take part of it. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance of every good work. What a crazy, cool promise. Our hands upon the work. You get to be part of it. And, and so I, I saw that in the eyes of those who are greeting me this morning. And as the team was meeting in there, having coffee and praying, and I, I'm positive you're welcome to come early anytime and pray with the team before and, and begin to participate in service. They love to get your hands on the work. God wants us to see those things. There's nothing more beautiful than being in, engaged in what God is doing and seeing the things that God is doing. To stand with someone and confirm their faith. To stand with someone and pray for their need. You know, to be in that place where you're just, just having your hands on the work. I just get overwhelmed when I think about the moments I've gotten to have with people that are so beautiful, dynamic, changing moments in their life. And uh, recently, I got an opportunity with a woman named Helen, and she's 90. And it was her birthday. And she had come to know Christ just in the previous month. And she received Christ and just came alive. She's a lovely woman, delightful. And I know her daughter, and their daughter was just overwhelmed. My mother's come to know Christ. And so on her 90th birthday, I got to get in the water with Helen and baptize her. And I'm telling you, her face, oh, Unbelievable. Watching her go underwater and then like looking and watching and seeing as she was coming up, the water coming off her face was like, oh, it's like she was being born. It's like she was coming alive and she was as she was confessing and re re being reminded of what Christ had done for her. She was coming up like a brand new baby. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I just got to be there. I, I didn't do anything. God did all the work. But my hands were in it. Isn't it cool to know that God leads? But he says, will you put your hands on it with me? Will you, will you be there and get your hands in the work with me. So as we walk through this, we see not only does he want us to take part in this and get our hands on it, but he often takes us places that uh, we don't necessarily want to go. In verse 3 and 4 of our text in the story, it says that he left Judea and he departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, what's interesting about this region was no pious Jew would find himself dead in Samaria. There was such a prejudice and brokenness between uh, the Jews and those that lived there in Samaria. If you, if you remember your uh, Old Testament scripture and you understand what took place with the nation of Israel, when they were taken captive uh, there in the southern kingdom of Judea, they, they, conquered the uh, they were conquered by the Babylonians and they were taken captive. But what they did is they, they left some behind the ones that weren't uh, good enough for capture, and they left them behind. Those Jews that were left behind then intermarried, and so there was this sense from the pious Jew, having been set free from captivity, of those that lived in that area that they were half-breeds because they didn't stay true to the law and to all of that. They had the law, and then they had other, other things they added to it, and so it was this mishmash. And so there's this real brokenness. And so here's Jesus the Son of God, leading the disciples. And he goes, you know what? We need to go this place. Not, not so much for Jesus that he had to go that way, but think about what the disciples had to do. They're, they're being challenged to get rid of prejudice, to get rid of brokenness 
in their heart and this idea that, wait, it can't be for all people, but here we're following the Son of God into a region we would never go. He's taking us there. Isn't that cool about our God? God, God wants to take you into those places that, that you're not necessarily wanting to go. <laughs> he wants to open your heart and my heart so that our hearts are like his for all and transparent to see all come to know re to repentance and healing. Matthew uh, verse 16, verse 24, when, when he, he would say this, um, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. In following Christ, there's denial of ourself. It was, there's a putting away of the old and a brand newness. I don't know what area in your life that you might need to, and I might need to look at and evaluate. Have I been carrying something or not willing to go to these people because they're difficult or this person in my family that's just rough or this, you know, whatever it may be. Whoa, what is it? How do I need to die to myself, lay that down, pick up my cross and follow Christ? Because he would say, you know what? It's needful that you go there. I weep thinking about some of the dynamics of family member that I've just kind of wanted to hold at a distance because they're impossible. Maybe you share that. I'm positive you do. <laughs> Somewhere there's, there's that in your life. But I was so convicted by this that God said, look it, it's needful that you go there. It's needful that you can be a light in the midst and change the dynamics of the generations that have gone before you in this. Jesus wants to lead us in righteousness and the ways, uh, and, and, and sometimes in roads we don't want to go. Broken relationships, difficult coworker. This is like a present thing. If you're in a place where you're having difficulty because the people around you are stubborn, they see things different, they don't know the Lord, maybe their political issues are this way or their social issues are that way, and you've just thought, ah, I'm not even walking by that desk anymore. Um, hey, I'm not asking you to be abused by anybody whatsoever, but you're the light in your workplace. You're the one that has that hope and knows him as Lord and Savior, and so therefore, who's he leading us to? I remember uh, back, I newly was in Vail, Colorado, and I got in, uh, this, this biker guy uh, died up in the mountains in McCoy. And if you know, Colorado has some sort of outback places not far from where Vail was, and McCoy is one of them. Maybe 40 people live up there, most of them bikers, and, and uh, they, th this guy died. He left two sons, two teenage sons, and it just so happened I was at a men's prayer time together in this little restaurant and we're praying together. This woman comes over and goes, I think you guys have like belief in God, right? And I'm like, yes. And she goes, well, I need a pastor to do this memorial for my friend. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we'd heard about him dying on the, on the past. I'm like, oh, we were just praying for his family. And our, our, our guys had just been simply praying, going, Lord, help us know how to minister to this family, the McCoys and uh, the, the McCoys. It sounds like McCoys and half It's kind of like that up in McCoy. Um, uh, help us minister to that community now that they're dealing with this loss of this man. And she comes over right then and says, um, would you be willing to come and do a, a memorial for us? We're gathering, uh, you know, it's tomorrow night or it was like the next night or whatever, and uh, we'd like to have you come up. And I said, well, yes. You know, God was leading me someplace. I'm like, okay, first off, McCoy. It's a kind of a sketchy zone. People I don't know, uh, kind of a rough crowd. Well, I get up there and I'm wearing my khaki pants, you know, my shirt tucked in, which is pretty awkward, and, and a, and a button-up shirt. And I stand in my little Bible and I, I get out of the car at this field packed with Harleys and motorcycles and all this stuff. And there's greeters at the side and they've got cases of Jack Daniels. And what they're doing is they're pulling Jack Daniels out and they're handing them to each one that shows up. And there I am with my little Bible. Hi, guys. <laughs> this here to do a memorial, you know. <laughs> they're like, here you go. Oh, okay, thank you. I've been sober for a while. And so I'm just going to hold back on that one. And, and uh, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. I, I now celebrate 33 years of sobriety, which is fantastic, you know, and I just, praise the Lord, yeah. And thank you, praise God. It's, it's just Jesus. And so, but, but, so they're going to hand me I'm, I'm good, and I, I realized that this crowd was just getting, just hammered, and they were just all over the place. I'm like, Lord, what am I doing here? <laughs> First of all, I just look wrong for the crowd, you know? I'm as wimpy and silly as it comes in my little pink shirt or whatever I was wearing, probably blue or pink, whatever. And um, he's like, I have you here. You prayed for it. You prayed for them. You asked me if, I, if, if you asked for salvation in this community. I got you there. So I opened the word of God and I began to show Jesus. I just went hard for it. 
Now you guys are running away, and here's the deal. Your friend wants you to know the truth of where he is right now. I don't know where that is. But you got to get right with the king. Man, there was weeping. There was, it was a crazy, I didn't know if it was going to be an uproar, what was going on. But I know for sure one thing. A woman that was in that group came to know Christ that day. And she called me the next day and came down to the church and wept and repented and got healed and restored and got baptized and built up and discipled. And then she became the church secretary and she worked for us many years and she went off into missions field. Like, thank you, Jesus. Well, I guess I was supposed to go up to those people, right? I was supposed to go into that group and to love them. And God opened up doors that we ended up ministering in the church there and taking over that church for, for a whole season, bringing pastors in and sharing to that community. It, but I didn't want to go. I was worried about it. My wife's like, I'm going to pray for you. An elder came with me going, this is so super weird, you know? And yet there we were um, doing the work. God, God wants to have you take part of it and to, to walk in. He, down roads even maybe um, you're not sure you want to go. Look now what takes place. So, so the disciples have gone off. Uh, well, I'm sorry. We're in, uh, where are we? We're, well, yeah, we're in Samaria with the, with the woman. Uh, verse 5. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So, so Sychar is uh, ancient Shechem. And so if you've been reading through your word, I know you guys have been doing that and reading through the word of God, you, you recognize Shechem and how many dynamic, powerful moments took place from with, starting with Abraham and even here as Jacob gave uh, the land to Joseph and, and so on and so forth. So um, you've got a, a powerful history going on here. Jesus needed to go through this area. They didn't want to go to a land where it had great, rich history that needed to be redeemed for the king. Jesus is a redeemer of what is lost. I, I think about how that happened with Debbie and I. We, both my wife and I come from families that didn't know the Lord and were, were broken in so many ways, and yet Jesus wanted to redeem that heritage of lost brokenness. Her coming from a Jewish family, me coming from uh, uh, just a, a broken, lost uh, um, line of uh, drug abusers, and Jesus showed up and said, how about a new way? See, when we're willing to follow the Lord and Savior down paths we don't understand, he comes into our history and renews us. Now, my children know the Lord. My children serve the Lord. My son is a children's pastor, a youth pastor in, in uh, Boise, Idaho with his wife. And God is, God is doing a work in them. So there's a redemption that took place. He wants to redeem you. He wants to redeem even the history and the place of brokenness that have been there. So this very unique place, he shows up. And then what's interesting is, is he shows, and John shows us in this, that Jesus was weary in his journey. And his body was weary. Isn't it beautiful to know that Jesus is one that leads? He wants us to take part and be part of. He wants us to, he's, he's the redeemer of the past, but he also identifies with the struggle. He's tired. His body's tired. He understands that your body hurts. He understands that the season has been weary, and yet this is the very place Christ shows up, redeeming the history, redeeming the past, and now revealing that he is, he, as a man, was vulnerable like you and I are, feeling the pain upon his body. And there's many moments through the journey that we get this glimpse of Christ in that frail element, but he did not sin. So he wasn't like, oh, I'll tell you what, oh, these disciples are making me walk too long. They really, you know, he didn't have vibe like that. He just was weary in it, knowing that it was going to be purposeful in the midst of this. And also there was grander purpose that he was taking place. It's about the sixth hour of the day uh, that he finds himself by this well in this great place of history with these people that the, the, the Jews did not want to go to. Heat of the day, not the normal time for uh, someone to come to, uh, to the well, especially a woman, to be coming to the well by herself. Jesus identifies with our trial. So look at verse 7. It says, so a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So this woman is there, and 
we can make some assumptions about her life, and we don't know fully about that. Well, we do know some things that get revealed about her life, but she has had broken relationships. She has sought love in all the wrong places. She's been trying to find belonging and connection and where it may be, and has burned some bridges and finds herself no longer with the other ladies in the early morning to draw water, but at noon, in the hot of the day, by herself, alone at the well, which was just showing that she was outcast, not belonging, not connecting, uh, needing of love, needing of care. Isn't it cool that's where Jesus was? I don't know where you are in your journey. Every one of us has a different spot. Maybe you find yourself at the sixth hour, broken from the decisions of the past and the things that have gone on. How grand is it that God needed to be in that spot, vulnerable with the one who's vulnerable? It's you and me. We're broken and vulnerable in that space. And then, then what, what I love about our Jesus is he's a God that initiates contact. It's not like he just keeps silent. I wish I could hear from God. Have you been outside today? Have you opened your eyes to the glory of God's goodness just absolutely everywhere? Yesterday I saw uh, an osprey flying with its talons out below, right above my car as we're flying out on the beach, just, just making this noise. I look up and I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord the creator of all, I see you in the midst of this. The, the, the challenge is, do we, do, do, are you looking to see that? Because he is making contact with you. He's longing to be the one that initiates contact. He says to her, give me a drink. Hello, I'm right here, right? In the midst of your weariness, your brokenness, and all that, Jesus is right there saying, do you see me? And he, and, and he initiates this con contact. Um, God is, is not hidden. Paul says this, and I mentioned this yesterday for those of you that with, with us at the marriage time, it was such a sweet time, but that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by that which he has made. That man would be without excuse. And the idea that we can see him, we see him in birth. If you've ever seen a baby born, it's that new baby back there in the back. You, you see God's hand in the midst of that creation, and you say, whoa, he's here. He wants my attention. Now, the challenge is he also wants us to give attention back to him, to pursue him in that. So he's asking a question that demands a response from her. He's asking her to respond back, and he's looking for that from you and I. And I, and I have a scripture for you I want to put just up quickly, because I want you to look at this proverb. This is a great one to just highlight in your scriptures you're reading through it, Proverbs 2. And I love the beginning because it shows the posture of where you and I are to be. Uh, he says, my son, if you receive my words and you treasure my commands within you so that you incline your heart, your ear rather, to wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as, as a hidden treasure, look at verse five, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. But, but, but do you see the posture? God comes into our, into our zone. He, he goes across every barrier, every broken barrier, right into where we are, identifying with our weariness, and he asks of us, hey, do you see me? And then the challenge is, will we treasure and long and lift up our voice and cry out for and say, oh, I see you, Jesus. You are Lord and Savior, and I want to incline and apply my heart to it because then I will know the fear and awe and knowledge of a mighty God. Nothing more beautiful than having a healthy, fantastic, life-consuming fear of God. And I could, it, listen, and, and if you don't have a relationship with God, that probably sounds pretty heavy, like, oh, man, that sounds like a lot of fun, living under the fear. And pain. I'm, not, I'm not of God, you know, oh, no, he's going to toast me any minute. And if that were the case, I'd have been toasted a long time ago. <laughs> it's the awe of God, which is a reverence of his goodness. It's a, it's, it's a fear that says, oh, Lord, I want my heart to be lined up with your heart so I can love my wife and my children the way you'd ask me to. I can love my neighborhood and my community. I can take part in the work that you wanted me to do. There's a, there's a beautiful healthiness to that incredible fear that comes when we say, he identifies with my trial, and he asks me to look and to participate with him. Verse 8 and 9. For his disciples had gone, so he asks for a drink of water. And then we see the story continue. For he'd asked his disciples, uh, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. A little side note on that. Imagine now their journey is, um, has changed. He, he's brought them into this area. And then while he's sitting there, he's like, hey, how about you guys go into the city? Humble yourself to find food among those you'd never connect with. 
I, I would love to get a glimpse of that when we get to heaven. Like, whoa, whoa, what were those guys doing, you know? Because they, they, were, they were ornery in many ways, right? The sons of thunder and stuff. Like, what are we going to go? I was never going to go ask them for food. I'm hungry too. And they're down there dealing with whatever, letting, their, you know, let, let, letting the God refine them in this process. Either way, they're over there having food. A little side note. Uh, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Let alone, so let alone a rabbi speaking to a, a Samaritan woman, a man even speaking to a, a woman at this time was a, was a horrible brokenness. And that was another element that God is the, the master of equalizing and redeeming. He, he, he takes all of those things out. He is standing in that place, asking of her. And so her mind was kind of blown. She acknowledges the intense awkwardness of the situation. She's like, hold on, you being, being a man and a Jew talking to me in this place sort of blows her mind. That's how it is with God. That's how I felt that moment I realized, you know, how could God love me? How is that possible? With the journey I had and the places I went, and it, 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 it makes no sense. Why would, you be cons why would you think of me? In many ways, she's just verbalizing. This makes no sense. How, how could this, how could you love me? God crosses every barrier. If you look at Christ's journey and where, where he's been through the word of God and the people that he has, the barriers he's crossed, he's gone to Nicodemus who had power, authority, you know, wealth and, and all of the things there as, as a Jewish scholar and knowledge. And yet what did he do with him? He, he was, this guy was moral and elevated and Jesus sat with him and showed him about the being born again from above watching him be redeemed. He'd be the one he'd speak and say, oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whomsoever shall believe on him won't perish but have everlasting life. The lepers, the blind. If thinking about Jesus pressing through the stigma of what it would be to touch a leper, for, to be even near one. They're, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. They're separated out. They don't, can't even be near their family. And they're instantly removed from society and from help. And then they have to say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Everywhere they go, everyone's like, whoa, 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 guys got COVID, really bad COVID. You know, and you just, <laughs> sorry, so that, that did happen sometimes with people. But um, luckily, we've got blue dots to stand on. Okay, you, sit, you keep your leprosy over there, man. Um, but there was a, a brokenness of connection in this. And what did Christ do? Being there in the midst of it, in the midst of weariness of the trial and so on. And he pressed past the stigma of what it is and touch and heal the one who's broken, the rich, the poor, the sick, the woman at the well, unclean, broken, lost in herself, whomsoever. God loves you. God presses through to where you are. She's like, I, 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 can't, I can't even fathom that this is happening. Here's Jesus' answer. And this, this is great. And this is kind of the, the portions that we'll finish up on here this morning. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink. You'd have asked him, and he would give you living water. He's the gift. He's the redeemer. He identifies with our trial. He leads us. He wants us to take part of it. He takes us to the places that are difficult. And he says, do you understand that I'm the gift of everlasting life for anyone who will believe? She's blown out. How can this be? Oh, if you knew the gift of God. In Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not that you're good enough, it's that you're sitting by the well. It's not that you've gotten your life together enough, it's just that you're by the well. It's you're in the place that Christ comes to, past every barrier, into the midst of your history and your brokenness. and says, do you see me? Do you see me I'm right here? And I love you. And if you knew who I am as Lord and Savior, oh, life everlasting. Look in 1 John 5, verse 20. And th th this, this, John gives us in this little, little snippet here in 1 John um, such a great answer to this. Do you know the Savior? In verse 20, he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. 
boom, book closes. That, that, that's it. It's so wrapped up in this. He, and here is just the beginning of the story, by the way. You're going to have to go and just read the rest of this account as you go through all the little dynamics of their conversation of where to worship, what worship looks like, who he is and the fullness of who he is, and then how there's redemption to the whole city and salvation and, and evangelism that takes place. It's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful account. But, but what we see in this is Jesus, the gift, and he is the giver. And here's what he says. If you knew this, you'd ask. Now, many of you who have walked with the Lord for, for a long, long time, you know this to be true about prayer. If you know who he is, why are we not asking? Why are we not seeking him? Why are we not coming to him daily saying, God, you direct my path. We're in the midst of the trees and it's crazy. We're in a place we don't understand. We're, we're past barriers we, we would never go before. We're dealing with coworkers or families that are difficult. Lord God, we're going places we can't go. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. We, we want you in the middle of that. If we know the gift and we know the giver, you would ask for living water, he says. You'd ask. Salvation starts when you and I respond to this question. When we respond to his encountering and his, uh, his contact with us. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, tells us very clearly that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Be saved. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. That, that's the response to the question. If you knew who I was, knew the gift, you'd ask, and you'd receive everlasting life. You'd say, God, please be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, wash me clean. I confess with my mouth, you're my king, you're my Lord, lead me on. And he would say, awesome, how about living water? Boom, and then all of a sudden there's a filling and a renewal. It's like Helen when she's coming up out of that water with that revelation of I have eternal life ahead of me. I have a hope eternal now. I live my whole life without it, and now I know is for certain I'm going to heaven to be with my king. Oh, the revelation of the confession of please give me a drink of water, Lord Jesus. And he says, oh, how about living water? Spring bubbling up to overflowing life. It's not just meant to be the confidence in that moment, but, a, but a li they understood this in the ancient terms of what living water was, was the idea of bubbling up, overflowing spring of water. So it goes here, and we go, yes, but then it goes, blah, 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 blah. Oh, get your hands on it. Keep following me. Come along with me and watch and see if I don't do mighty, abundant, beyond all you'd ever ask or think. In Acts, we have a powerful testimony from Peter as he proclaims, who Jesus is to all of those on the day of Pentecost. And if you recall, their, their question was, well, we, what, what, what do we do? What do we do? Peter would respond in chapter 2, verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 